So what is the role of biology in controlling carbonate precipitation? And what is a carbonate factory? Can we have different types of factories? Let's find out in this class. I'm taking you to the UAE. <music> So I'm standing here at the outcrop on the Munsandan Peninsula. This peninsula is divided between a United Arab Emirate part and an Oman part. And it is closing effectively the entrance to the Arabian Gulf. But the reason I selected this outcrop is because the rocks behind me here are of Permo-Triassic age. And we've done quite a bit of study on them. And what's interesting is they contain the mass extinction at the end of the Permian. This mass extinction also impacted carbonates. And that's the point here. Carbonates are living rocks. They're made up of mostly biogenic components. So we will try in this class to understand what carbonate factories are. On this slide here, I'm showing you that carbonate factories can be understood or divided based on the type of precipitation that takes place on them. So the best definition of a carbonate factory, I think, is the place or the location where carbonate production takes place. So if you look at a reef, you can see that we have a location here that is teeming with calcium carbonate producers, in this case, corals. The fish are just here because they're pretty, but they're not important. But you can see that in the shallow water, we have production of calcium carbonates, whereas when we go into the deeper water, we still see corals, but less and less. And so that location where production of carbonate predominantly takes place, and we'll explore in the next class what controls the, the production of carbonate, well, that location is effectively the carbonate factory. Now, we can divide carbonate factory into multiple types of factory. So we will focus on marine carbonates in this class. Lacustrine carbonates exist, but in terms of volume, except for some weird exception in the South Atlantic, they're not extremely uh, frequent or common. So, Marine carbonates can precipitate from a, an abiotic source. This is a cement. And we've seen in the previous class that we have different controls, chemistry, pH, that will determine whether or not carbonates will precipitate. But the largest volume of carbonate um, sediments will come from biotic precipitation. That means from things that are controlled by biology. In this, we can distinguish two types of precipitation. One is known as biotically induced precipitation. The other one is known as biotically controlled precipitation. We'll look at both cases. So let's focus on biotic precipitation and more specifically, biotically induced precipitation. So what is biotically induced precipitation? Well, Biotically induced precipitation is the oldest form of biologically mediated precipitation. It's been around since at least 3.5 billion years. And you've seen it if you've seen stromatolites. Stromatolites are effectively algal carbonates. So why is this biotically induced precipitation? Well, it has to do with photosynthesis. Blue-green algae take six CO2, carbon dioxide, and six molecules of water, and with sunlight, a source of energy, generates sugar, which is a chemical energy that can be stored, and a byproduct is oxygen. And of course, this is photosynthesis. Now, what's interesting is we've seen that carbonate associated with a, a metal ion. So in this case here, we're looking at a carbonate ion with a calcium that gives us calcium carbonate. We know that this is a reaction that is favored at a higher pH. And so if you have any process that will increase pH, not lower pH, it will be beneficial for the precipitation of calcium carbonate. 
Well, it so happens that photosynthesis consumes CO2, and so you're pushing the equilibrium back to more carbonate ions and less carbonic acid because you're using that, um, that carbon to produce sugars. So let's look at how things happen in an algal mat. So here I'm showing you the first layer of an algal mat. An algal mat is effectively these algal filaments that are also paired with some, some kind of a colloidal gel. It's, it's a carbonate gel. It's not completely crystallized carbonate, but it's a colloidal solution that will eventually solidify and give you a hardened rock. So what happened next is this colloidal gel can trap sediments. Those are the yellow particles shown on this, uh, on this slide. And these trapped sediments and the colloidal gel eventually will solidify. And when they solidify, of course, this is bad news for the algae because the algae that is below the hard layer will die, but the algae that is above is able to grow and give rise to a new layer of algae. This is why those stromatolites are layered. It's because they grow on top of each other. Each generation of layer of algae is growing on top of the previous generation. Now this is a tremendous advantage for the algae because it means it can keep up with sea level and stay close to the zone to the zone of maximum penetration of sunlight, which you need if you're photosynthetic. But the way this precipitation of calcium carbonate happen is not controlled. It's induced. It's because the photosynthetic process consume CO2 around the cells of the wall, if you want, of the cells of the algae, it induces an increase in pH, which is favorable for carbonate precipitation. So that's why we have this precipitation, this induced precipitation. And you can see this in the rock record. I'm showing you beautiful stromatolite that date back from to the Precambrian, and you can really see those nice concentric ring on the stromatolite.